if I cannot make it funny, I don't touch it. Okay. Is my general protocol to start. If it's not funny yet, I'll circle back to it. Small doses, self-help from the hip. Small doses, we're talking that shit. Small doses, and keeping it real. Small doses, with me and them seals. It's so funky. <laughs> People, you see what's happening to my left. Um, you see what it is. First of all, I just want to acknowledge that he followed the directions. Mm-hmm. Instead of just showing up in any ragtag wear, mm-hmm. pink or red, red or pink, came through in the red. So I wore red in Los Angeles <laughs> for you. Courageous. Had a green jacket on top of this. <laughs> going Bundle. to the Uber. <laughs> like I was naked underneath. <laughs> Can't let them see this red. I got to get to the couch. I'm Not t- you via Robin Gibbons and Boomerang. <laughs> <laughs> on your way to I Marcus's leave, house. Taking this off. <laughs> Where you going with that red on, homie? I'm going to do a, a, a <laughs> program with my friend Amanda Fields. I'm not a gangbanger. What that red be about? Well, uh, it's dyed. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's about scotch and soda. Actually, there's a... <laughs> popular uh, <laughs> podcast that you should uh, probably partake in. You would understand the color stories that are required to bring it visually to life. Yeah. You're listening to the the sultry sounds of Roy Wood Jr., who we all know. I, I mean, I always tell people you're one of my favorite comics. Thank you. Um, And I love that I get to have a peer. That's my favorite. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm. that's really cool. Bleeds. And so today we're going to discuss political comedy, but y'all know you put someone I like. Uh, first of all, let me just say, I like everybody interview, but someone I know. Someone yes. I know. Because let me tell you, I, people ask me, like someone asked me the other day, like, why do you only interview your fr- friends and fans? Because it's my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. You know, like when I did Mark Maron's podcast, he was like, you know, people sent me your stuff. And then he was like, I watched your special. And I was like, this is someone I can talk to. Like, yeah. that's his meter. Yeah, Marin is like, I don't know you, but let me see if I rock with you. Yes. Well, you are. It's already pre-installed. Either you already rock with me or I already rock with you. That's it. Come on the show. Come on the show. Thank you. I'm interested. I find you interesting. You know, in this case, you know, Roy and I, we've been rocking for years. Uh, my mom is a big fan. I like that Roy Wood Jr. He really <laughs> nails it. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you came on the Amanda Seal show right after the... Uh, White House pre- co- the radio show the, after the White House press correspondence, correspondence dinner, dinner. Yeah. Um, and now you're coming here which is overdue by the way I feel like we were trying to do this all year and now I got you and I got you because you got time the issue <laughs> 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 yes I ain't got to rush back to be at the Daily Show offices right now because uh, that ended but Normally when I'm in L.A., it's long enough to do the thing and then it's back for Daily Show or Fatherhood mm-hmm. and started blocking out time. Where, okay, I'm going to L.A. for these days for this thing, but I'm going to add two more days. And right. now I have the freedom to do that. So it's cool. It's cool to be able to do that. What is the freedom? How does the freedom manifest? Because I think a lot of people would see Ooh. someone leave the Daily Show and think it's a bad thing. Right. They might think, oh, man, I hope he got SAG insurance, you know, because uh, that's what I when I say people leave a show. The first thing I think of is I hope they met their health insurance quota for the year so they can get health insurance from SAG. Yeah. Like, that's all I think about whenever yeah. I see some like if I see someone die on a show, I'm like, I hope they meet that quota. <laughs> he only had two episodes. <laughs> it's hard out here. It's it's fun to be able to sit and just think. Like, like, I don't know, like some folks thought it was like lip service, but it was the truth. It was like. What was the truth? Because some people listening do not know how we got here. So earlier this fall, I stepped down from The Daily Show uh, in the role of correspondent. Okay. After eight years. Yes. Great time. All right. Eight years? 2015, September of 2015. Los Angeles, yes. September 15th. Yes, I know, because that, that's because I saw you <laughs> earlier that summer. And I said, I'm moving. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You and did so a bid. It it was, but it didn't feel like it. Like, I didn't realize it was eight years, so okay. I read the article. I was like, oh. That's that, a good relationship. 
it was perfectly fine. But then when you start, you also have to acknowledge when you think and feel like a relationship is run, has run its course. Yes. And then inevitably, I feel like every relationship we have, professional or personal, you're either growing closer or growing apart, period. There is nothing that runs parallel but streets. Look, wait, can we dive into that a little bit? Because I had a professional situation where after two and a half years, it still felt parallel. And I said, oh, we got parallel to me at that point feels like, growing, yeah, feels like a part. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is what this will be. And I just think for the work that we do, it can't stay that way. Yeah. And sometimes you have to jump before you figure out what is next. And that's just how I've always lived my career. It's not the most responsible way <laughs> to do things. Now, where I'm blessed is that I've been able to have 40, 50 cities of comedy dates this summer and another 30, 40 on the books for next year. Oh, wow. So in terms of paying bills, yeah. being a father and a co-parent and running all of that. And serving your creative spirit. Perfectly fine. Okay. So if this thing is becoming stressful, I have to step away to take time to figure out what I want to do next because what The Daily Show doesn't lend itself to because of the nature of the job is mental stillness. Mm. My job every day at The Daily Show, whether I'm on the show or not, is to take in all every of the day. worst. Oh, my God. And, and, and. Make it funny. Make it funny. Make it funny. So you cannot do that all day. And then go home and go, well, I wonder where late night is going. What would be the lighter thing that I want to exploit? Like for mm. me to write and truly create, I got to be still for a number of weeks, months even. So Maybe. I left the show to take this time between now and the end of the year, especially when they haven't decided on who the host is going to be of the Daily Show. So if you don't know who the new host is, I don't know if I fit into that. And I don't know if I'm going to be the host. Don't seem like it. But in the interim, I'm going to take some time in case I'm not the host. So if you don't pick me, I'm already on second base with yeah, my next yeah. idea. I can't wake up in January with no man. job. But it takes getting fired a couple of times to, <laughs> to, to see. You can feel like yeah. you can smell a, <laughs> you can smell the end of a job coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should be able to. Some people do not. Their arrogance stands in the way. It's like a storm. And you from Florida? You yes. know about that four o'clock storm? Yes, you can I do. smell it. I, sm I can't explain it, so but you real. can smell it before it comes. And so I'm like, oh, I see what's happening here. We just going to guess hosts until they decide who the new host going to be. And the new host might not even be something that I want to fit. Where is late night going? What is this show going to be? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, I need to step away. Yeah. I need to step away. So that's what I did. And so... You know, I've been able to use that time. You know, you write a script or two. You try to sell scripts. But in terms of a place to spew my opinions and perspectives on the world, that has to probably be constructed from scratch. And when I look at the programs that do it well, most all of them were constructed from scratch and they weren't derivative of anything else. Like if we're talking about, like, say, a John Oliver or mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. Z-Way was doing or mm -hmm. Amber Ruff, especially with women. Like, cause y'all don't get to inherit nobody's seat. Y'all just got to no. build y'all own. Yeah. So every time. So it's like the idea of, well, what does that look like for me? What could that look like? And then figuring that out, ideating that and starting the process of building that type of IP up. Yep. You cannot do that and be a father and work the road yep. and take in all the bad news and figure out a way to emotionally cleanse your, mm -hmm, your soul mm -hmm, every mm -hmm. day, mm -hmm. your emotional air filter, if you will. Yes. So some had to get taken off the table. So it, it started there. Have you always felt like um, stillness was a safe space? Because I know, I feel like in the past, I feel like when you were on the pod in like, 2017, yeah. I feel like you were not about that life. You didn't actually, no, I remember. I remember you being like, I would go on walks with my lady, but I'd bring my Walkman. Like you were like, sets. yeah, you were like, I don't want, I was like, you don't want like peace, calm. calm? No, and you were no, like, no, no fat. <laughs> no, I, I, now I'm also two years into a newborn at that point. Yeah. 
and the paranoia, and I think that's what I'm free of now. Oh. The paranoia of job security. So you have the Daily Show, and you have an hour special, then Comedy Central gives you another hour special, and now it's an election. So the pressure of, and that in those days, I was gone 35 to 40 weeks, 40, 35 to 40 weekends a year. I was gone On that road. polishing the new hour to put it out to try to get more popularity mm. so I could get the next hour. So you got to go do another 35 yes. foot. So I can't sit still because this is an opportunity that does not come often. And I have to seize it. Yeah. And that's not ideal in terms of being the best comedian, correspondent, or boyfriend, if we keeping it 100. Right. Because every day, I think I said this on the pod too, good partner, Good father, good employee. Pick two. <laughs> Every day, you're going to suck at one of these. Good father, good partner, or good, good employee. Job. You know, do your job, family, you know, like those, yeah. those are the three. So I have that conversation with my cats. And yep. it, okay. And if you want to be 100, <laughs> your relationship with yourself should Ooh. be the fourth. Ooh. Because, you know, the love of your life is the love of your life. Oh, now see, put that on the shirt. Right? I read that recently. And I was like, <laughs> it me over. So there was an inequity in how I spent time, but I saw it as a necessity because as a man, I believe in providing. So that's what needed to be done. And I would argue that where I am now, having left The Daily Show, mm -hmm. I'm in a position where to some degree, I'm not going to say I can choose my own adventure, but there are opportunities that are being put in front of me. I want you to claim it. I want the, you to claim that. Because honestly, that's what the not stillness of those of that time was for. That's what it was for. And so now I get to take an opportunity to sit still and go, okay, what is the one thing or the two things that I can do mm -hmm. that leave time and real estate yes, so that I can live. be these other things properly? Time for myself. Date you somebody new. Is? Find time for that. Budget the time. Like right now, I'm oscillating weekends. What just so I happened? Have, uh, I'm oscillating what just weekends. No. What just happened? What? Fine. I just said co-parenting and me, we broke up. Oh. Sorry, friend. Hmm. I'm sorry, friend. I know you rooted for us. None of us can stay together. Yeah, but it was. <laughs> but no drama. And that's the thing Ooh, that I'm. Look at you, Susie Blue. Perfectly, perfectly good co-parenting situation. We love it, maturity. You know what's wild about breaking up with somebody? Is that even after you break up, she's still the most important woman in my life. Well, no. What's wild about breaking somebody who's the parent of your... Okay, you're going to be your <laughs> I was like, because okay. that is not the most important <laughs> in my life. Okay. <laughs> okay. Understood. <laughs> yeah. But because everything for me is for my son, and she is the co-pilot in that journey. So Ooh, I, That's I, hard. If whoever, if, if whoever thought they were dating you is listening to this show right now, they just felt some type of way. What do you mean? Because when you say it out loud that this other lady is the most important woman in your life, even if it was your mom, whoever is trying to date you is like, well, where's there's no room for me. Well, come on aboard. We're Will and Jada this. I don't care. I don't know. I don't know. Not Anybody like that. Okay, not like that. Not like that. <laughs> Can we but, just also take a second to point out that everyone's like, Will and Jada, you know, Will, Jada's, <laughs> why why y'all won't let Jada tell her story? She has had a show <laughs> for like years. Red Table? Yes. <laughs> telling her story. So I'm like, did we not, were we not there for that? That was a lot of storytelling. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, I mean, you-, you Does it have to be in written form? You've opened up a whole separate can, though, because <laughs> then, because then the argument is, well, is my son more important than you or the next person I date? No, you know what I'm saying? but I don't think that it's the son. It's the way you phrased it. Well, okay, Once you say then, this woman is still the most important, but Moni, am I wrong? Is she not important? No, I'm not saying she's not so important, but once most? you say she's, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, All the women in the room agree. You got to take that most out of them. Okay. Well, now, because okay. in the well, hierarchy. Well, then step up, then. <laughs> Tell one of y'all step up, then. Most. <laughs> I got to raise this boy. I can't do it alone. You won't. You won't watch him this weekend while I go do the gig. <laughs> but she gonna watch him. I'm sorry, Moni. I'm raising my voice. Okay. <laughs> but no. But this idea of okay, what is the thing I can do that now leaves real estate to take that walk? And not be listening to my comedy set yeah, from last yeah. night. That's because gross. I'm preparing for the next thing. 
So that's gross, yeah, man. Even therapy. when you came in here earlier, you were saying, you know, you 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 were like protecting your peace. Yeah. I don't know that. I think that's like really newfangled for a lot of us. This concept of like peace. But then you had said something, and I hope if if you want me to take it out, I'll take it out. But you no, said something you know like, "I speak freely. I never." You know. <laughs> well, you said that you kind of sometimes feel like guilty, or not guilty, but like you don't want the protecting of your peace to then translate into like some sort of like I'm being rude or I'm being disrespectful or disconnected thing. Yeah, I've. I'm still unnecessarily conscious about how choosing myself makes other people feel. And then I try not to feel bad about it or I try to candy coat it in a way so that you don't feel hurt by me no longer. And that's my fault because I've spent the last, I've spent the entirety of my life up until like, let's say the last year and a half feeding emotional stray cats. And so... People expect certain things of me because I've always given it because I never put myself first. But yeah. then when you choose yourself. Listen. Bucket that. They get upset. That and boundary? That makes me feel bad. And that makes me feel bad. But I'm still like, yo, I can't. I can't do that thing. For you. I know you want me to do that thing, but I can't. That's where I'm at. I know you want me to hire you for the thing, but I don't think you're prepared. And it's just going to fuck up my production if I bring you on. Mm, so I can't. Even in the professional space. Especially in the professional space. That's, that's where, what, see, I don't, I don't feel like, I I don't feel like most. people tax me in the professional, but in the personal, they tax me. I don't get taxed that much in personal, but then I also, I have friends in quadrants anyway. Same. And most, most of anything anybody needs of me is in a professional capacity. Mm. Like I got a couple cousins that might ask for money or something like that, but like that doesn't even bother me half the time. Because that's not frequent enough to be some problematic thing. Right. But when it's, hey, man, I've already told this guy that I know you. And when oh. you're in town for the thing, he wants two tickets to the show. Oh. And then you just, you, person I barely know, the, has committed two you tickets. You acquaintance. Okay. We had a side yeah. conversation about friends and acquaintances. Okay. By the way, I'm going to have to do a whole episode <laughs> on side effects of friends versus acquaintances. And you've invited, or, or, oh, oh, I'll tell you a story. Tell me a story, please. Let me take off my shoes. I gave, I gave two tickets to my show one time. Okay. And this is a cat I have known in the past, acquaintance, if Around. you will. Yeah. But when we ran, we ran. Okay, okay, okay. But we grew apart. Okay. Because life happens yeah when i moved to new york most of my out of town like like it, these are the people when you used to tour as a road comic yes this was my drinking partner in this in, city yeah yeah and yeah, anytime yeah, i'm yeah. in this city me and this yeah. and then you grow up you become a draw you stop playing that city mm. because you're more you're in this city now yeah and you're in this club i'm well, not in lexington this, no you're more in this theater. i play indianapolis yeah yeah what's the biggest city i'm in cincinnati so yeah None of, on the strength of our history, you are worth two tickets to the show. Fair. No problem. Generous. This is this is in this is in Minneapolis. Come to the show with five other people. No. And they paid. Oh, okay. So it's it's him and five other people, and then they come backstage pre-show. Pre-show. And drop anchor and sit, and there's nowhere. And I wasn't even pissed for me. My opener came in, and there was nowhere for her to sit. And I just got furious. I just got furious. Who was opening? And the, uh, it was, this was Amina Amani. Okay. So, shout out to I Amina have opened Amani. for Roy Wood Jr. before. It's a great, great host. Yeah, then she got huge. And then was, no, that's not she, true. She, she, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I use, I use an experience that we had in a bit. That I did. Oh, yeah. oh. So there's that. But so, go on. So, so they, Amina, but no one constantly. noticed that she was. They don't know who Amina okay. is. So okay. far, they know she just my girl, or she just work at the club. Like she just who is this? And they just sitting on the couch and they just eating and snacking. They just a eat. Whoa. But I can't snap on you because my comedy requires me to be emotionally still. It's one of the reasons I don't argue. Like I'm not a very confrontational person because it. With my like Clarence, um, <laughs> Clarence, like Terrence Howard and uh, Hustle and Flow, you f with my mode, man. 
So I just kind of usher, hey, y'all, we got to get ready. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But the audacity of you, you. And then you would be wrong, in quotes, if you had said the audacity of y'all to be in here and drop anchor. So my frustration at this point is that, like, you can't just say what it is to so many people because they consider it unkind. But also keep in mind, in his defense, that's what we used to do for years Fair. when I played Minneapolis as a, as a little homie. You can come backstage and drink because we was all But with five people? Party. No, it didn't, wasn't that good. <laughs> but now it's cool to know me. I know. That's what I'm you, saying. You get this. Where you're the hood ornament, you're the shiny thing that people present to their social circle. And look, look at me, everyone. I am, I am adjacent to this wonderful person. So it's more of a brag for them to bring those people backstage Here's the part to gain me, status though. with those five people. It's the drop anchor part. It's one thing to bring people backstage, say hi, and move along. But the dropping of the anchor, meaning like the sitting down and like planting ourselves in your dressing room is so audacious that I genuinely am confused by it. Seven people in a room that seats four. Easily. Easily. And four probably like is just like... Four adults are going to feel it. Yeah, and it's not fair to Amina because she's the opener. She has the most important part. She got to get the crowd ready. Yes! With her mode. So she deserves some solitude. And it's one of them venues where there ain't nowhere to tuck off nowhere else. I, I know. Y'all got to get the out. I'm sorry. And I'm trying to figure out the most polite way to say that in the moment. So do you feel like and you wish you weren't trying to figure out the most polite way and you were just like saying it? I, or wish, do you... I wish I had that in me. Really? And I don't. And like I'm reading this book, boundaries, when to say, when to say yes, and how to say no. Mm. I'm not done with it yet. Okay, but <laughs> but it's like helping me and figuring out the the best ways. But I feel like at the end of the day, I'm still stressing myself because I'm trying to protect your feelings. And I don't think. I, I guess where I find my struggle with that is that like I don't think there's anything wrong with trying to protect people's feelings. I think what what ends up happening some so often though is that in the effort to protect other people's feelings, we are stressing ourselves out so much yes. that it's kind of counterproductive. Um, I had someone like yes. get upset at me for just telling them straight up based on their actions, "You're unserious. I get it. I'm going to move on from like this professional connection." And they said to me that I was unkind for saying that they were unserious and that I should have presented myself in a more like emotional like. I, instead of saying you're unserious, I should have said, you know, when you didn't email me at the time you said you were, that That's hurt my feelings. That felt like relation. That didn't feel like that was the kind of interaction that should happen in a professional or even in an acquaintanceship. Because your d hasn't been. And so. Okay. That's the prerequisite for the therapeutic for that, step. For that level okay. of, yeah, if we're going to okay. do all of that, like, or at least there has to be a desire for the to be. That's fair. Right? That's fair. I have to have at least a curiosity about it. For me, <laughs> for me, it's rooted in, is this relationship worth saving? <laughs> well, there's that. If it is, then I will engage and we will address it and we will figure out a tactful conversation. But if it's not, I just wouldn't have responded to the person and I would have taken... No, it was a, it, it, you would have just not answered the call? The phone call? There's a cat, there's, there's a cat that shot some video for me. Um... I hired him to do some video footage and it's like 350. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was just, hey, you want to come shoot some? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a trade off. I get a little footage for social. You get to say, you should, you know, the credit, you, yeah. yeah. I ain't going to make you do it for free. And if you want to just shoot 20 minutes, shoot 20 minutes. You ain't got to shoot the whole show. My just right. Happy to be happy to with you. Yeah. Ask me if I got that footage yet. Did you get the footage I yet? I got that footage okay. yet. So now, I can I can go on the internet and cuss you out. <laughs> That's always an option. I can text you. I still ain't gonna do nothing with the footage because I don't want to use your footage now. Because I don't even want you getting crazy. Like I don't ah. even want to have to attribute. You know what's interesting about this is that the 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 label of this episode, the title is Side Effects of Political Comedy. And even though we haven't talked about like politics <laughs> in the way that people think, what we're talking about though is the politicking of like interacting with people. Yeah. Right. 
And that when you're a comedian, I, do you really, I feel like we are so hyper analytical in the world and then we turn it to ourselves and then that's how we end up getting so stressed out all the guys. Yeah. And then, and then it's also a situation where I was very kind. I paid on time. I paid, I paid that day. Right. But I did it, all the things I, I was supposed to do. Correct. Trying not to be that type of client. Right. Like you got to follow and chase me for my money. But right. now I'm chasing you for my footage. And that ain't cool. So now the next person I hire, this is getting a <laughs> list of demands. And then he's going to say, Roy's difficult. That's a lot, man. And can you believe all this shit I got to sign? Yes. Matter of fact, use my camera. Shoot. <laughs> I don't think that that's... I think that as you're stepping into a more independent space, that's just simply protection. It's, it's kind of like a necessity to do that. It's given me when you're nice and gracious, people try you. And I'm having to close the door on that. It's so disheartening. It's also, by the way, like in a romantic space that that way, like as a woman, like realizing like I've spent a lot of my life having a hard exterior. And now when I'm interacting with men, I just am in a softer space and it doesn't matter. Yeah, they still going to be on that. Yes. <laughs> but this whole yeah. time I thought it was me too. Right. I thought yeah. like, you know, both of us had the, and now I'm like, you played it straight up and still got got. Damn. I didn't, you know, I didn't pull no cards. Yeah. Nothing. I was over here. I was just being sweetie past seals. It, sweetie past seals. That would be my name if I was in a Negro League. How do you keep it from hardening you, though? Like, that's the thing that professionally I'm trying not to become hardened. Be but it's, man. I think what how I keep it from hardening me is that I am relentlessly protective of not letting other people's whackness turn me into something I don't want to be. I've like even like post daily show right. I'll, I'll give you this is another great example. Post daily show, I've gotten calls from people from other like shows or networks or whatever. Yeah, right? and so and and I've been on the record for the most part about what happened and what I don't want to like. It's clear. Yeah. Well, what well what if, what are some things that you didn't that you don't want the soul the sole thing i did not want to do anymore while figuring out what to do next was remain a correspondent because it is a hard job period full stop that is the truth what makes it hard the idea of taking in all of this information that is negative and trying to find something positive then having to share all the stuff that you're not going to use for jokes and not let that emotionally pollute your psyche the rest of the week in the month then go out and actually shoot the segment that is the one thing that you're going to go and do while also touring as a comic and trying to be present as a father. Was so, there support internally in, in this creating? Or do you feel like that was also difficult? No, that's fine. No, there's you have writers and producers and there's people collaborating and helping you Great. ideate. Okay. But it's on you to carry the weight of the yes, story and the sadness. Yes, it is. That's and literally why we have two days of the radio show where one day, Thursdays is group chat Thursday, where we just chatting about just different breathe. topics. And Friday is breathe. fun day Friday. It's literally Black Joy Friday. Like we don't have any bad news on Friday. And that's what I'm in now. Like since leaving the show, I'm on that Thursday, Friday mentality. And within the show, there's fun stuff set up every month. And like there, there's, if you need to talk to somebody, like the show is set up places oh, wow. where, okay. hey, Go over there and breathe. You ain't got to work a little bit. Just work a little less today. Go yeah. Go out, go across the street to the park and do something. But I don't want, if nothing else, the job of correspondent, I don't want to do, right? And you know that. So why the f*** would you call me hmm? and go, hey, heard you left the Daily Show. We got a fun... Got a fun offer for you. <laughs> what if we sent you out to kind of... <laughs> Report it kind of correspond <laughs> the information. It's not correspondent. No, 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 no. But we send you outside. It's correspond dish. Do I host? Well, no, we're not gonna host it. And I can't be offended. Why? I can't be mad at you. Because Why? people can only see you as they've seen you. The evolution of yourself, you're the only one that can see that. So 
I know what I want to do next. I know what my mind is opening towards. So I don't think those people are even like most of the people that have contacted me after the show. It's here's the idea I want you to do. Versus, I feel you. And I think that's the offense. Yes. It's not necessarily the job correspondent, but at no point is anyone asking for collaborative input. I've had that same experience. Yeah. So it starts and begins there. It's like, and that was part of it. What makes you think that I'm, because also there's a certain level of the audaciousness. Again, let me tell y'all something. If audacity, I'm being too gracious. If audacity (laughs) was sold at gas prices, we would have a different world. All right. But it's free. It's free. Because you are too brilliant to have to stomach people who don't even do the thing that you do coming to you to be like, here's what I want you to do. Like, there's no humility in that. And you deserve yeah. it. And so... Do you hear I, me? Yes. I agree with you. Because I told you Do your that. agents know this? Oh, yeah. They know. This okay. Ain't this is just... They better protect you. They have. They have. But I've also... I have a different definition of the agent-client relationship. What's now. really... What, the what's manager-client your... relationship. hmm I don't work for you. You work for me. That's different for you? And... No, but in the ideation standpoint, it's the, well, here's some things we think you should do next. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that, guys. Thanks a lot. But here's what we're going to do. Yeah. And either you with it or you ain't. And it's going to show within two weeks whether you with it or not. And if you're not, then I'll bounce. And I've seen more than enough examples of people getting it done without people like you. But I like you and I appreciate everything you've done so far. So let's see if we can get this done. And so far, so good. Everything's been fine. But... This idea, but you know, you, you, you're ushered into the game when you're young. You get a manager and an agent and you're taught to trust them. Like Listen. some sort of guiding coach or stepdad. Like a guru. Yeah, I know nothing. Tell me what I should do next with my talent, sir. And you get into that. I didn't like the that. way your bottom lip quivered. <laughs> Jeez, so you get into that rhythm of a relationship. And it's it's almost it's borderline abusive, and so you only date what you used to, and so you used to being with somebody that's telling you what y'all gonna do next. Yeah. And then one day you just go, oh wait, no, that ain't what that ain't how the game go. Like when I told him I was quitting, there was no pushback. Oh, that's great. And if there had been, it was gonna be a big problem. Why do you think that there wasn't pushback? I think they just trust me enough to know that wherever I'm trying to go, they're just committed to helping me get there. How do you feel like you built that relationship? Did it start that way? Or do you feel like over time there was just demonstration? Because I feel like you've been very demonstrative of your talent in and of your vision, right? You, the fact yeah. that you got to the White House Correspondent Dinner to me was like a really great accomplishment. And I didn't get to say that to your face. I've Thank texted you. it to you. I've said it to you on Zoom. And I'm going to say it to you face to face. I'm going to touch your hand when I say it. That was a big deal. I have to give a, I have to give a shout out to uh, Erica Lowe who works in the White House, a uh, wonderful, wonderful black woman on hey, Uruka. the black media. Um, I don't know. The, you know, the White House got these long names. Mm-hmm. These, they do. But they do. her job is to help make sure that black folks are getting access to the White House the same as other media. Okay. And that connection started the, I won't walk you through the dominoes, but yeah, everything that you just thanked me for started with the conversation with Erica Lowe. Fabulous. So, shout out there. Um, I think that with my agents now, because I, I've i only been with them two years. Where are you at? I'm at CAA now. Who's your agent? And so, uh, Erica Lancaster and Ava Greenfield. Mm. And so... I will withhold commentary. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> so, for me, with the agencies that I was with before, I just never felt like there was proactiveness because The Daily Show is what it is. It's, yeah. It's golden handcuffs. Right. And so the idea of trying to do more, be more, I was starting to think in that lane. And I think bringing them on board, there's definitely a, okay, so what are we going to do now? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's fear of being fired or whatever, but that was my biggest fear. The only person who had an issue with me quitting was Tom Joyner. Tom? The OG Tom Tom Joyner. Tom is my boss. (laughs) Tom at Reach Media, and I'll say this on wax. Tom said, 
You got another job lined up? Because <laughs> these classic old black men. Yes. Because my mom was very much like, you know, my mom knows some of the insider stuff. Like, well, if you feel like you need to move, go ahead and move. My yeah. mom's always been, even when she ain't understood, my mom support me. And Tom was like, what's your job? What's this is a job? man who flew between two states for like 10 years. Every day. So... Did mornings in Chicago, afternoons in Dallas. Yeah, like fly jock didn't mean fly like your style. Like he was on a plane. Literally every day. So he is not somebody that would understand <laughs> quitting a job, is my point. <laughs> like, so you telling me I could do radio in Dallas and in Chicago? Why not? Most of us would be like, dang, I have a hard decision to make. Tom broke Tom my said, I'm getting me a million miles. Yeah. Come out. Yeah. Uh, but no, it, it's just a matter of looking at the landscape and knowing what's next, but then staying true to that. And it's hard because some of those offers and opportunities that I'm like, eh, at are coming from people and companies I respect. Okay. And so it's like, oh, I would love to work with you, but not like this. I and can't. there's no breathing room? There's no... I'm sure I could counter, but I haven't had time to really sit and think about what I want to do. I might not want to do it with nobody. I might want to be like you. I might want to set me up on my couch. Listen... This was really, this small doses thing came out of me having done small doses for years. Somebody telling me, Amanda, uh, actually Jamie, my, my, my social media, my, my YouTube person telling me, you know, Amanda, people are, these white girls, first of all, she said, these white girls are making millions on YouTube. And that's, that was really kind of all I needed to know. If the white <laughs> girls are making millions, I could at least make a couple thousand, a couple hundred right? Thousand. So then I'm like, okay, but like, how do I... How do I go into this? And the the biggest, most difficult part to me of being independent is that entrepreneurial mind because I don't necessarily feel like I'm an entrepreneur. I think I'm just an artist who doesn't want to uh, deal with the... So I became an entrepreneur by way of being a political comedian and not wanting anybody to tell me the what the I can say or not say, right? Like right now, the conversations that are having that are being had at the time of recording this are around Israel... In Palestine. And people are like, Amanda, I'm just so amazed at like what you're standing on. But I am standing on this, not just because I feel this very deeply in my soul and spirit. I also have consciously set up a life where I can speak honestly and earnestly. And there's there's as little in there, there's as little interference as possible into my life. Yeah, because I, I think with you and the way you stand on issues as well, the inevitable path for you would have been the same as what happened between John Stewart and Apple, where John mm. Stewart walked away from his show, The Problem, Did he? in the middle of pre-production. Uh, this is about a week at the time of the, our recording, about a week ago. John Stewart. The, this ha- where was I? Did you know this money? John Stewart walked away from season three of his Apple show because Apple didn't agree with the outline for the episode for AI in China. What? Walked away. Apple said, you're going too hard. Apple said, you're going too hard on China, Playboy. You're going too hard on that AI, Playboy. We need you to lighten up that that, that take. And John Stewart said, I'm straight. I'm a hollow, though. Where's John Stewart? Can you come on the pod? <laughs> if he ever out here, that dude don't travel. No, that man be on his phone. We do digital. What you have to travel? <laughs> <laughs> we 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 set up a Zoom in the so in the, pen, in the when big you pen. talk about standing on something, and you talk about you know side effects of political comedy. For sure, a lot of political comics are going to be dealing with the corporate needling and noodling. If you go back to Hassan Minhaj, and you go back to what happened on Patriot Act with the Saudi Arabia episode, what happened there? Where have I been Yo, trying to do this podcast? Hassan went in on, I don't know his name, Prince, whatever. Let me let me straighten it out before they come find my... Google that uh, real quick, Moni. But Hassan went in on the leadership of Saudi Arabia and all the atrocities and the drama and the journalist Jamal Khashoggi who yes. was killed. And so Rest Hassan spoke his mind on that. And Netflix was like, yeah, Playboy, we're going to have to delete that episode up off the server because uh you know netflix has a lot of saudi money invested in it though i appreciate you but so they didn't cancel this whole thing and it didn't it, it didn't come to the same john stewart yeah thing. but it, i mean i'm sure that it had something to do with it not continuing po- probably possibly maybe by so. him maybe by his case you know? and that was and, but that was a later that was in, and that was in a late the saudi arabia drama was in a later season where they had momentum and he goes cool let's mm-hmm. see who else we can punch and the corporate money was like hang on that big dog and so, you know, John Stewart, I think, essentially had a similar situation between himself and Apple. Only Apple 
cut him off at the pass instead of deleting the episode. Because knowing Hassan and them, they probably didn't send Netflix the outline. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so we're just going to do this. It's like, what you going to do? Ah, yeah, some Middle East stuff. No big deal. Uh, upload. <laughs> Netflix Ding. is like, what the f*** is this? So, yeah, I think that being in a position where you are free to do what you want the way you want is something that it's I'm, I'm excited by the possibility of it. I just got to figure out what it is. Um, but, you know, I look at people like you and what you all have built for yourself. And to me, to a degree, this is the future of content and opinions and late night and all of that. Like, because you all are in a position where, I don't want to say TikTok, but like social media has made it so anybody with a microphone and a good opinion matters. Yeah. So if you do yeah. that. You don't necessarily need a desk and a studio audience and a glossy, glittery floor. It's true. To reach millions and of people. And a whole crew and, to and make a whole bunch money. of people yeah. to con- that you have to convince that what you're saying is necessary. How many notes calls are you on every week? Do you talk to your producers <laughs> and get edit notes? Or do you just go do the Well, even in producing in Amanda We Trust, right? Like the political comedy doc that I did the reality of be, it being done was literally just because there was no one to have notes with. That's how it got done. There was nobody that I had to talk to to make the like immediate decisions that I needed to make in order for it to get across the finish line. So you're telling me when you reached out to, to Rashida that you didn't have three hours of pre-call interviews? When you reached out to all of these people you talked to? No. There was not. Jamal, Ilhan, Paul. No. And honestly, I think there wasn't because they were like, oh, this isn't a big old network that we're dealing with. Like, we're not having to go with the, like the, the type of red tape and things that we would need to clear. Like, we don't need to. We trust Amanda's voice. And so we're going to stick with that. That's beautiful. And I think that not being aligned with the network to a degree is going to give certain creators more access because audience is power. Like people say content is king. Okay, but audience is power. And if you have an audience and you have a point of view, then people are going to rock with you. I'm excited to see what Bomani Jones does away from ESPN now. Hmm. Like that's going to be some dope. Like it's... What is it that makes talking about politics interesting to you? And is it still interesting to you? And, and when I say politics... I mean, at this point, the word politics, I feel like is so bastardized. Like it's very, it's so loose when really it's like there's people who are politicians and there's public servants, right? Like there's, yeah. there's government and then there's like the administration. Um, what is it about this spe- sector that you find interesting or are you over it? I'm over This is going to sound negative, but it's not. Let me finish the sentence. Will do. I'm over national and global politics as a place from which to mine content. Yep. My preference is local. I care about local politics because that's where all of the issues are ultimately going to trickle down to every piece of government dysfunction. So I feel like in a political satire show, right? We're going to talk about the issue and we're going to talk about the people either for or against the issue. Like in a daily show, like a field piece in a daily show is the bad thing. And it's either your interview options are who caused the bad thing or who is helping to fix the bad thing. Okay. Those are your two buckets. Yeah. So causation and blockage, that's cool and that works. But if it were me, I would rather talk to the people that are affected by the bad thing, whether they're trying to change yeah. it or not. Just the people trying, just to show it. There's a um, there's a story I could never get approved on the show because it was just too local and there was no way to connect it to the greater, bigger thing. I am, and it's probably too black too. And that's probably part of what <laughs> That has a habit of getting in the way. In the black belt in Alabama, especially in cities like Selma, 
raw sewage backs up into the front yards of people every time it rains because of septic tank chronic issues that have been happening there for decades. So when it rains, your front yard becomes water. (gasps) Water does nothing but put cancerous toxins in the air. And if you look at the cancer rates in the black belt and relate it to the septic tank, tank belt, you'll probably find a lot of correlations. Okay. But hey, let's come on down here and march for the bridge crossing. Selma, yeah, let's remember right. Selma. Let's lock arms and walk. Oh, yeah, we walking and locking arms. Can yeah, we go John a- Lewis. Hey, thank y'all for swinging down, rich black folks, and taking your pictures and dipping. Would you like to come see the water around the corner? No, I wouldn't. I got to go. I got to get my private jet in Montgomery. So if it's me, that's if it's a Daily Show issue, right? That's a bigger conversation about the environment. I don't give a about none of that. Talk to me about these black folks that are dealing with some on a regular basis every single day. And then the people who come to town and talk about being part of the solutions of blackness and betterness, we still won't even talk about that. We come back, we keep talking about, and this is just Selma specifically. And I'm only saying Selma because it's a spot where I have a little bit of a, it's a sore spot for me. Yeah. In terms of how it's I feel like sometimes it's used as a political grandstand. And there are not longer conversations, lasting conversations that happen about other things that are happening in that area. And maybe, you know, we we can get into outrage policing in a second. But for me, if I have a camera and the backing of a network, why the would I continue to spend time talking about the same everybody else is talking about and everybody else is giving their opinions on. I guarantee you ain't nobody going down to Selma and talking about water and how to stop it. So for me, Mm. at the local level, what are the issues? And those are the things that I like, even like on the charity side of the game, like it's, it's reading and baseball. Those are the two things I care about. Those are the two things I put money and pound the pavement to do because I believe in those two things bettering black neighborhoods. Baseball? Yes, absolutely. Please expound. Baseball teaches you failure. Baseball is a game of failure. Baseball is majority failure. And black it's, people need to learn failure? You need to learn how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we got that now, Pat. <laughs> I don't know, bro. I got to think. Well, that's one thing we could teach. Yeah, it's patience. It's patience. It's strategy. It's waiting for the right moment to make your move. You're alone, but you're part of a bigger ecosystem. To me, baseball... Mm-hmm. It's a team sport, but it's really a bunch of people individually doing well within the within their space okay. to help the community. <sighs> the community. Your job is just first base. Don't worry about second. Don't worry about left field. Because second and left field are worrying about second and left field. Correct. And you can trust that. Correct. But just do what you're supposed to do when it's your time to do something. But do exactly what you're supposed to do. What do you so, think we're supposed to do with this election? I know that's a very small question. In 2024, I know you don't mm-hmm. care about, you're not interested in mining new content. But no, let me tell you no. the number one question people ask me, Roy. I'm not against national and global politics. I'm just going, where can I... No, no, no. I know. I, I completely understand okay, that. Yeah. No, completely. But the question people keep asking me, because one, they're like, you're a comic, so you're not like as... Uh, they're, they're like, you're the last standing of like actual <laughs> un, unrestrained thought. I'm like, okay. The question that people keep asking me is, what are we what are we supposed to do? Biden supported Israel. Uh, do I even need to vote? And I'm like, okay. Locally, and we, we talk about local, local, local all the time, but I don't want you to think that national doesn't matter. Of course not. But I would love to hear your thoughts on like, do you feel... Um, I just love to hear your thoughts on where because because it feels a lot it feels heavy to me. Okay, but then but then that same issue goes back to what I'm saying is that most voters only care about how something directly affects them. Yes, most voters are single issue voters. So if you go back to like say sexy red, sure, ski. Let's bring sexy red. My booty holes purple. Pink is this couch. So <laughs> <laughs> I think you mean a. Her- <laughs> Whatever she said. I'm 44. I have not listened to a sexy red song. So I love that for us. <laughs> I love that for us. No diss. It's just it's I know just, I'm I'm not the demo. I, I know I'm not the demo. I'm listening to a tribe called Quest. 
So, Sexy Red, somebody asked her about Trump. And, and it's not just her. There's a lot of black people have that ideology. Trump hooked up the chicks. Right, which is... The stimmy. He gave me the stimmy. The, 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 that's enough the for me to vote for. better under Trump. So that's all some people. That's going to be enough for some people to vote for that man. That's how Trump got elected. Trump went around and sold wolf tickets city to city. Yeah. Oh, you do coal? I'll save you. Trump could have walked up to a blockbuster video and said, I'll save <laughs> I'll save DVDs. <laughs> If your business and your livelihood is based on DVDs. I love DVDs. They're around, they go in a thing, and they play a movie. I love it. Amazing. Fabulous. And then Biden comes into town and goes, well, I think digital's the wave. You're not going to vote for Biden. And you don't care. What, is, oh, I mean, what do you know about digital's exactly. the wave? He can't surf. So, you know, I don't know. I still think that if we talk in the Black community and we're talking politics, it's going to come down to what are these candidates going to do for me? And there's a lot of black voters that are tired of putting their knees to the side for the greater good. And you're going to find, and that's how Republicans are going to be able to pick off a couple of black voters, even if they lying to them and going, no, I got you. I see you. I'm going to take care of the thing. And those black folks, if all they doing is waking up, stepping in water and somebody go, I'm going to fix water. Yeah. You don't care about the other stuff. And we've become disjointed as a race, you know, we don't stand tall and lock like that anymore. We don't. We're all individual thiefdoms of ideology. Fiefdoms, not yeah. thiefdoms with a T-H. Yeah. Fiefdoms. Thiefdoms. Medieval times. Groups. Yes. Lords, Factions. manners. Mm -hmm. So. Fealty. Yes. Oh, nice. Ooh. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Renaissance era. No Beyonce. So, so I just feel like 2024, I believe that there will be more voter apathy than ever. And that only hurts the Democrats. We can't hear you. That only hurts the Democrats. Correct. But it doesn't just only hurt the Democrats. It hurts all of us, in my opinion. All of us who want to actually have our rights resemble even kind of resemble what they've been for the past 20 years, I do think it hurts all of us because it does trickle down to a local level because it empowers the local legislations to then also follow suit. CRT. Like I think, T yes, CRT, I think Tennessee is like a really good... Um, Case study on that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the national conversation is this bet. Well, now the local school board is going to change this, this, and this. And now the textbook manufacturers who don't want to lose the bag of selling textbooks to these districts have agreed to change stuff in the textbooks as well. So now we're beyond independently authored books. Right. You know, some George S. Johnson getting back. Like now we're going to Houghton, Houghton Mifflin, Houghton Mifflin, Houghton Mifflin. Huff, you know how you I know, know it's Houghton Mifflin? Oh. Because I used to be in Houghton Mifflin textbooks. <laughs> I used to do photo shoots for Huffington Mifflin and HBJ. <laughs> you was a textbook model? Yeah, like I'm with the goggles and a beaker. <laughs> like I'm holding you the looking books. in the microscope? <laughs> yes, yes. It you was have a time. lived a life. I have lived a whole <laughs> life. Textbook modeling. <laughs> Y'all didn't put that on my resume. I didn't even know that was a textbook thing. Textbook model, yes. I... Because when you look at, say, something like women's rights, which is also a major trickle-down national to state to local issue. Yes. It's, it definitely, I think the bigger question about voting is, about voter apathy, is how do you get people to care about something other than their own neighborhood? There's also this other thing now where it's like, how do you get people to see that voting is not... And maybe you disagree with me on this. Voting is not the place to carry out your moral compass. I agree. And I think a lot of people think that. Like, they're like, I don't want to vote for this person because I don't like that he supported this. Correct. And I'm like, I hear you. I don't like that he supported this either. That doesn't help you. Like, you not voting for him is not the burn that you think it is. Correct. And it's also not the virtue builder that you think it is. Well, it's, you're not going to... Because now you're getting into change the system. But most people who just go, I ain't voting for neither one of them. How you like that? They ain't saying... 
about changing the whole system. No. And that's, I don't think that'll ever happen because too many people are getting rich off of the system the way it's constructed. So you're talking about tearing down major corporate societal. You're talking about aliens, is what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At this point, it's like aliens, where y'all at? Well, they're here. They told us, and we didn't even give a. (laughs) It was a story for a week. If that, they said, yeah, we got some bodies out there in 51. (laughs) And we was like, yeah, anyway. Anybody want to see Did you see that boat fight in Montgomery? (laughs) Like, there's aliens. Yeah, but have you seen the boat fight? They were swimming. (laughs) (laughs) There's aliens. You don't understand what I'm saying. There was a chair. Was swimming with the shoes on. That's probably an alien. Swimming with all his clothes on. <laughs> but about the folding chair. Exactly. So, but honestly, though, it was a time. It was a good time. It was a good it time. It was a good time. I just don't know how you change people's ideologies like that. Because like what you're talking about, like I think of like society when it runs perfectly is more like a beehive where all mm. bees act in sacrifice of the hive. If there's an intruder, whatever it is, is for the betterment of the hive collectively. It's okay. not him himself. There's an intruder. I'm a honeybee. I'm a sting you, knowing that I'm going to die. But it's going to keep the hive alive. So yes. you have to give up your vote for the betterment of everybody, even if you're voting for somebody that's against a thing that would keep the water out your yard. I'm sorry to keep bringing back. Well, you know, the hive mentality, some people call a bad thing, but, you know, you you present it as a, a positive thing. Well, it's the only thing that you, like, if you are dealing with, let's just say you had a candidate, pick any of these 19 candidates that have declared, and you're... And, Tim Scott? Okay. Give me, <laughs> give me Tim Scott. I'll give you Tim Scott's girlfriend. <laughs> he got a girlfriend? <laughs> That's the point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he said he has a lovely Christian girl. You would think by now you'd like worked out the paperwork to hire somebody so you can help. Could you? you know what he did instead of getting a girlfriend huh. when they were pressing him? He just showed up with a goatee <laughs> <laughs> on on the on the day on the debate. It was like, I don't got a girlfriend, but look at this goatee. That's right. Women like the goatee. Women like the goatee. Why do you think I I'm... kept mine? I grew up for a movie <laughs> and they just kept it. <laughs> Tim Scott's a perfect example. So Tim Scott championed a police reform bill that was countering the George Floyd policing act that Cory Booker and the gang was trying to get passed through. He um, was count. It was countering it. Tim Scott proposed a police reform bill. I did not know about that. Okay, put me okay, on. Okay, so now you, let's just say you are a person who has lost X Y Z person to police violence. Yes. Police came in your house. Killed your family. Right. And you said, and we got to stop these cops. Yep. Cory Booker's bill could not get passed because there was not enough support from the Republican side of the game. I don't remember the specifics of both dueling bills, but I know one of the specifics was qualified immunity. And the Republicans don't support being able to sue police officers civilly. Which is bonkers. I agree. But if you're in a something better than nothing equation where at least the cop can't go work in another county. At least the cop can't go do X, Y, Z. Republicans have put a bunch of things in their mm-hmm. bill that match the Democratic side of the bill. Let's get we, that bill passed. And you know it'll pass because the Republicans have enough votes. Who you voting for for president? Even though you know the rest of Tim Scott's platform is about bonkers. But he's got the one thing that you believe needs to happen in this country because you were a victim of it. So now if you vote for Tim Scott, you're voting against the Hive. Collectively, but individually, you're getting exactly what you need. And Tim Scott gave it to you. That's your guy. You're going to vote Tim Scott 2024. So what do you do? You have to let go of all of that collective pain and look at everything else with immigration and women's rights and CRT and the environment and everything else that Tim Scott is railing against that will f- this world up and is f- this world up. Right. How do we get Black people to let go of them, of that feeling of being wrong, which we are entitled to, to still say that their vote matters for the guy that they don't agree with because that guy supports something that they take personal or that they are themselves been a victim of? How do you change that? I mean, I think it you change it by 
we well, we have to fortify community again. And we we they did a great job as they destroyed our communities, literally, right, with bombs and guns and Correct. violence. And then also literally with the 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 mental warfare of, you know, just how media has has projected, oh, these black people are dangerous. You don't want to be one of those black people, do you? Mm-hmm. All right, so you're going to be over here, right? So creating that kind of like internal fake idea of what a model minority would be within blackness, which is like, baby, none of us are model <laughs> minorities, okay? None, the most model minority we are is Naomi Campbell. Like, we're not that. So I think there's just a disconnect of what it means to be community. We've We've been running the we're not a monolith for a long time not realizing that there is somewhat of a detriment to that statement, even though we, in my opinion, even though we um, have to announce it because there's also the idea that like, oh, black people are the same. And that can be problematic. Correct. Um, I think it's like being able to find language that says we're not the same, but we have the same issues. And we have to care about that for our brothers and sisters. So like when, so then... We are the same. We have the same issues. We have to care about that for our brothers and sisters. To me, at this point, within the Black political discourse, that message is better said from someone locally than someone national who comes into town. Absolutely. Because what the media has done a great job of, and probably some of the Black organizations to their own disservice, a couple of them fumbled the bag and somebody ran off with the money. Yeah. Or even if you didn't run off with the money, Mainstream media and Republicans have done a good job of slandering you enough to where the message seems skewed. So anybody that sound like you, you or look like you, when you come to town, I'm already looking at you sideways. Mm. So that level of political activation has to happen. It 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 has to happen, you know, locally, and it has to happen with people that are of that of that area. And I think that that would matter more. There's a there's a woman I need to shout out on TikTok, uh, Bell Curve, Bell with an E at the end. Bell Curve at Bell Curve K U R V E, and um, she checked me and Trevor. Okay. On TikTok, there was a. Remember when they had the vote to end slavery? Yes. That Thirteenth Amendment vote in like Louisiana. In Louisiana. Bell lives in Louisiana, so. We made our national joke, you know. Hey, just slavery. Back we're on the ballot. Slavery, man. How are we still talking about slavery? I remember this bit. Mm-hmm. So Bell played that bit. And that duetted me and Trevor's. Boy, she got in us. You started and writing Angola? And no, she, she broke it down at the prison level. And yeah. so you hear slavery, and it's just, oh, slavery. Because that's societally, yeah. but it's prison labor, it's prison slave labor. Yeah. So then that becomes, and that's a bigger debate about the Daily Show and the writers and figuring out, well, how nuanced do we want to be? Are we just going to be silly? Or are we going to, re- well, getting in the weeds isn't fun and we don't have enough time. But whatever it is, a woman like that who is going, all right, I'm going to hold y'all accountable to be better about that joke next time and be mm. more specific about that joke. And she did. It was fair. And we talked. It's, it's cool. And so you take a woman like that who is on her every single week on TikTok talking about specifically Louisiana issues. Got it. And if you are a black person in Louisiana and you're trying to decide, you're trying to figure it out, she is a better mouthpiece than anybody who could ever fly into town for a weekend, whatever it be. And the more people you have like that across the country in these black communities that are also able strategically to reach people and navigate a f- algorithm that shadow bans any content that's actually talk right. about suspicion. To me, that's how you start reaching people with the message because, you know, if we're talking just you messaging, just how, do you even, for me. how do we even just get to people to even tell them what's going on? You know what I'm saying? And so that's... As a comic, though, I mean, do you feel like when you're going to these different cities, do you tap into those type of people's content and form anything around that? I haven't. I'm going to start next year. I'm going to Canada for a month, and I've got to, like, tap into Canadian politics a little bit just so I have something different. Yeah. That's a little more, you know. Saskatchewan. Get into it. Bespoke. (laughs) 
to the, you yeah. know, Justin Trudeau just got a divorce. We'll start there. Hockey! You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that Sorry. Canadian football sure is crazy. Um, Have you watched Beckham? The documentary on David yes. Beckham? No, I haven't. Okay. Are you a soccer fan? I don't like it enough. Bro, I feel like I've been missing out. He lived a life. Well, I just soccer football yes. is is really a whole like America is so whack with this metric system and not being into <laughs> soccer and like kilometers. I just I just really what I didn't I don't think I truly understood. This is a complete dovetail, but I just didn't understand the 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 um the grandeur of football. Like yeah, I knew like that a the Super Bowl fans, every week, right? But I didn't know that for them, it's a show, like for the actual players. Because I don't feel yeah. like for football, y- you get you get your prime times ever so often. But for the most part, like, it's just on the field doing what they do. Because local pride is tied into that. Also, football overseas is, like, generational. Like, we just getting Major League Soccer here. You didn't grow up didn't with your know. granddaddy. I just didn't know these folks were... Right. Like, Beckham is like, I play for Manchester United because that is my dad's team. Like, that's who I wanted to play for. And so, like, you know, it's a whole... I just didn't realize... Here it is. I didn't realize how theatrical it was. Like, for them, it really is theater. Like, the running and sliding on your knees and just, like, the whole coming out onto the field. Like, I just... it It was actually... The fan, there's some soccer games. I sound really American right now, so shout out to everybody who's like, wow, she sounds really American. There's some soccer matches where the fans get there two hours early to stomp in the stands. Uh, it's a team in South America, Boca Juniors, and they deliberately put the visiting team's locker room under like the rowdiest part of the stadium. So the fans get there two hours earlier to just, just to stomp. stomp. So you're in to the... torture them. Wow. That's dedication. That's bro. literal war tactics. That's inter- <laughs> that is like, literally terrorism. Noise and light disorientation type. We're just gonna doom, 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 doom for two hours. It'll drive you crazy. And now you must come out here and play me in soccer for an hour and a half. <laughs> but um, no, how do we activate people, man? Like that's no, but I love when you said you were going to Canada, but I wanted I like because I have some we have some questions we the people want to ask you, but as a political comedian in this in this landscape, do you feel responsible? Do you feel any level of obligation to level up? Because mm. if you if we feel like this is a you talking about running for office like you shut up <laughs> <laughs> level up. What you mean? Okay, so like to right really now, step into the. Yes, like I issues. feel like we, I feel like you and I similarly have always had just an intellect about this. And so it has fallen into our work by nature of just, it's a part of our landscape. Like you've been on The Daily Show for eight years. You just drawn to it before that though. Right, but yeah. you also like have an interest in it, right? Yeah, you so, was about that long before you married comedy. Yes. To, yeah. Then I feel like we are looking at our nation really gr- like drastically changing before our eyes. Like we are seeing like real um, pr- like praxis being put into place by factions that are very admittedly racist, right? Admittedly mon- misogynist, admittedly fascist, et cetera, et cetera. So it's no longer just like, oh, I'm talking about this thing because I know about it. Now it's like, oh, I'm talking about this thing because it's happening in real time, which to me feels like pressure to not just be talking about it, but to be looking at this work with as like part of activation. And I'm just curious if you feel that same pressure, knowing that things are heating up, things are getting more intense in the way that these folks are crawling out of the cracks of the woodworks. If I cannot make it funny, I don't touch it. Okay. Is my general protocol to start. If it's not funny yet, I'll circle back to it. Mm-hmm. But if I cannot make it, because that's my gift and that's my responsibility to the hive. Right. I know how to make stuff funny so that hopefully people who don't quit it will digest it. And then hopefully, if not change, then go out and be a little more educated about the topic that you thought you didn't want to you close your nose, ears and la, 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 la. But, I'm just asking, do you feel any heightened level of pressure within the current landscape to to do that? No, because if I can't make it funny, I'm not worried about it. 
it's terrible. But then in the idea of how do I attack this issue? Well, if I'm just talking about it, there's already people talking about it. Every angle is already, that's, there are plenty of people, I've seen the land, there are plenty of people checking all the boxes of points that I would have made. Okay, cool. What can I bring different to the conversation? Absolutely. That's humor. Most of these people are not funny. They don't have the ability to. So to be able to take that dynamite and juggle it and make somebody, and not necessarily laugh, but just even just to get you to look at it through a different prism, that's my objective. And so, like, you look at the correspondence dinner. Like, that's, to me, the ultimate in dynamite juggling. Because it's like, all right, what am, what am I going to say about all this? I know half of y'all going to hate me anyway, but <laughs> let me go ahead and say it. And at least if it's funny, I know half of y'all was with me. But it still had to be funny. It was. It could have one of them just done a speech. Everybody do a speech. So... You know, to me, the pressure of figuring out what is worth talking about, what needs to wait, and what am I actually passionate about, and what do I know? Because, like, it's, to me, the pressure is where are my passions versus where, what people really care about, and not spreading yourself too thin through all of them. That's the thing that's stressful. It is. I ain't gonna lie to you. I I do feel pressure to find ways to use these platforms and to use this comedy to edutain in a, in a way that I haven't before. I've always felt like that was a, my purpose, but now I feel. I know this is a this is probably egotistical, but I feel like if I'm not trying to do that, then I'm part of the problem. I agree with that. But then the question, to me, the question to myself is, now that I'm aware that, oh, I was just doing this because this is what I like. Oh, it matters and y'all need it? Okay. Well, I can't cook faster. I can't Mm. make any more. Like, my process is my process. Like, in a way, I don't know, I feel like we're like the, this is a terrible analogy. We're like the barbecue spot that just run out of meat at like 3.30 in the afternoon. Oh, so a Jamaican spot with oxtail (laughs) that runs out at 11 a.m. Texas brisket, all that. (laughs) Yeah, where it's like, I'm glad everyone loves it and that it's needed in this world, but the process for me to create what you all enjoy consuming remains the same for me. And I don't know how to change that into Mm. a way. Or I think the weapon that you have that a lot of comedians don't is that you have multiple platforms. So you can get you can run different offenses. Radio, you can sit in a pocket and get serious if you want. Yeah. Over here, you can do this. On stage, stage is the stage. Correct. And then on stage, you also do something that I think is just as important, which is you are a release. Smart, funny, and black show, that live show, that is a bubble that removes, like it's a vac, it's a, it's a struggle vacuum. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like where you've removed all of the stresses that you rail against on every other platform, but here it's Friday. And we are going to just laugh. We're going to enjoy black pop culture. We're going to dance. You have dance breaks in the middle of a show. <laughs> and so that's... I was excited for you to come because I, I don't get to have these kind of conversations enough. And sometimes it's like it requires people like us to be on a podcast <laughs> to, to have it, even though we have phone numbers. It's like, <laughs> but you're, you know, you're right. I think, um, I think we also are, we're a small group. Like political comics are a small group. Black political comedians, it's a very, 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 like people, and when I say political comedians, I just mean people who can do it. Yeah. And who choose, who choose to. Kamal Bills of the world and such. Well, um, the people have questions. Like, before, real quick before the questions. So my son is into firefighter, just in firefighting and all this stuff. So we watch all these videos. How the kids just decide they're just into something. Like yeah. so he's just into firefighters. Firefighting and aviation. That's his that's his mode. That's his jam. But not just the trucks. Like we're into we're down deep rabbit holes of watching helmet cams of firefighters actively going inside fire. Like there's yo, there's YouTube channels of fire departments just showing you, yeah, this is what it's like in fire. It's horrifying. Oh, and your son's like, I love it. It's fascinating. Like they wear a body cam and helmet cam, and they just sh- you just see a guy going. It's just there's just a room of flame, 
And then there's guys on the roof for venting. And so this is how I look at political comedy. And I thank my son Henry for teaching me this by making me watch firefighter videos. Fire truck pulls up. One team goes on the roof to vent the roof, cut a hole in the roof to let smoke out so that the smoke can escape in the fire room so that the room is more visible for the firefighters entering to fight the fire. I see. Okay. That's the basic strategy of firefighting. Go in with the hose. Somebody up top cracks the roof. Uh-huh. As the smoke dissipates, you see where more of the fire is. It's easier to fight the fire. The I room see. Is cool. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. You have to have a vent man. You have to have a hose man. The that vent man and the hose man. You make okay. me sit up in my seat. Okay. So, whether you're the vent man or the hose man, your job is the job. If the fire, while you're in there fighting the fire, and the fire spread to eight more buildings uh-huh. that are connected to this building, uh-huh. you can't do shit about it. Because you're the vent man right here. And you're the hose man right here. There are other firefighters coming that will do vent. the venting and the hosing. So this sense of urgency to hurry up right here is what I feel. But at no point am I thinking, I've got to save all of that. i got to do all of the issue. i got to address everything. Like, I try to sit in pockets of where I know I can be at the highest level of comedic advocacy. I and need then to move that. on to the next thing. I need to get that. Because I feel like I'm looking at the eight buildings. But you only got one hose. You know I got a lot of hose. <laughs> <laughs> They pull them questions up. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Y'all know what it is. We got Roy Wood Jr. here, and we're going to head on over to my Patreon with the SEAL Squad to answer these questions that y'all ask. So if you want to go over there, you should join us at Patreon Amanda Seals, or you can go to theamandaverse.com. It's both going to get you to the same place, which is where you're going to get the answers to these questions. Questions like, do either of you fear retribution for your political beliefs? Questions like, given the current climate and your past experiences, how do you as comedians comedic, intelligent creatives reconcile or navigate through the current and past relationships you've made? That question was too long. Questions like, dude nailed the Thomas is a NTF joke. What was the origin? <laughs> all right. So questions like that. We're going to get over there. All right. I got a death threat from a man in Montana that he wrote in a Bible. He wrote uh, the death threat in a Bible? And highlighted like all of the revelations, fire and brimstone. That's, versus, that's the kind of crazy that concerns me. <laughs> but we didn't want to make it a slavery slave master yeah. joke. You're like, that's, yeah. that's low hanging. And then we're, exactly. It's like, I don't want to do that. And then we ping pong and I go, oh, he's owned. We can see him. He's not ours. We can see him, but he belongs to somebody right, right, else. Right, 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 right. And somebody on the Zoom. That's what an NFT is. And we just, fell out laughing. <laughs> Trevor is a fortress on social media. You can't reach him other than in public when in the comments. So right. DMs, but the guy wants to DM the threat. So he'll send it to me. And like, hey, Trevor, just want to give you an update on your death threats. The- <laughs> what are your thoughts on white political comedians decrying quote unquote cancel culture and quote unquote wokeism as the reason they feel comedy has changed? They all selling tickets and making money. Ain't no cancel culture. Shut up and tell your jokes to the people who pay you to see them. There you have it. That's the answer to that question. Well, I got to tell you, um, I, I hope that the process allows us to hear your voice loudly in this upcoming election year. You're needed. I think the device of comedy is going to be incredibly necessary in trying to combat the immense amount of misinformation, of apathy. Like, I feel like we we really are trying to convince people to not walk into their own um, slaughter. Yeah. It's that Bird Box movie. People... (laughs) All right, that wasn't a good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember, like... If you look at the thing, you walk towards it and it kills you or whatever. Yes, yeah. yes. And I feel like we've... One thing that I feel like people are still in agreement on is that they love to laugh. 
Um, yeah. I think that the spiritual base has shifted immensely, right? Like people aren't really going to church like that. Like also Christianity has become so weaponized and bastardized in this country that a lot of the younger folks are just like, ah, I don't even know what the good in this is because the the bad has become so disingenuous. So like comedy still ends up being at the root of things like, oh, this is a place where I can laugh. And there's something still pure about that, yeah. that is also still only able to be mined by certain folks. And so someone like you, um, you know, putting on that helmet with the lamp and mining for it. I'm, 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 I'm over here encouraging you to now that you do have more free time and, and stillness to, um, to add another level of purpose to it. Challenge accepted. But I'm fine. <laughs>